Hi, welcome back, everyone. We're going to kick off here now with our summer program talk, so aka CMCC camp. It is it's not really a camp, all right? It's a two week long summer research program. Uh, two month long, eight weeks, yes. It's a good thing she's here. Uh, so two months, eight weeks, uh, June through July. Students attend daily lectures and then also work on projects, both uh, small scale projects that we curate, as well as projects with external collaborators, external partners that we have. So it ranges from individuals in our network, professional teams, uh, others in academia that pitch ideas, and then the students work on them for an extended period of time. Uh, they present at the end of the program, as well as come back here and present them at the conference. And the students in this have done an amazing work Work, uh, all these, uh, all, all the years that we've been doing this, and especially, say, uh, this is a, another solid group that we have coming up for you here now. I'm not going to introduce the students. Instead, I'm going to turn it over to an alum of the program, Meg Ellingwood, who also is a third-year statistics PhD student in our department. So I'm just going to manage the computer, and I'll let Meg do the talking. Let's, let's applaud. <laughs> So I had the honor of being one of the instructors for the program this summer, which was really awesome. Uh, and so to turn it over to the students, um, we'll have uh, the first group kick it off. This is uh, Sarah Colando from Pomona College, Jonathan Pipping from the University of Florida, and Christopher Wilson from North Carolina State University here to talk about their work um, on horse racing analytics. Awesome. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back from lunch. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I'm Jonathan. This is my colleague, Chris Wilson, and this is Sarah Colando. And we're going to be presenting our work um, on clustering racehorse movement profiles to discover trends in injured horses. So the motivation for our project is twofold. So this last summer, the Churchill Downs in Kentucky had to suspend their races because 12 horses got fatally injured in the spring season. And several uh, racehorsing associations, such as the New York Racing Association, are committed to lowering the prevalence of injuries in racehorses. And at the same time, um, better racehorsing data has um, come out and advanced in the last several years. For example, in 2022, the New York uh, Racing Association, as well as the New York uh, Thoroughs, Thoroughbred Horsemen's Association, co-sponsored the Big Data Derby, um, where newly released tracking data was available for, pu available for public analysis. Sorry. So these are the two. So this motivated our project and really to understand where race horse injuries come from and understanding what movement pro profiles are associated with those injuries. Um, but to do that, the severely injured and fatally injured horses are very a very small subset of actual, all the horses that are racing. And so we don't actually have that much signal about the injuries in horses. So this led to our first goal, which was because we thought that the under racing was correlated to um, latent injuries, to first identify the horses who under raced between 2019 and 2021. Sorry. We then wanted to cluster movement profiles for the horses who under raced, or sorry, the, we wanted to cluster movement profiles for horses who raced in a New York race in 2019. and then discover whether certain movement profile uh, clusters are associated with injured horses and or under racing horses. So we had three primary uh, data sources for this. We first had 2019 to 2020 severe horse injury data. Then we had start lists from 2019 to 2022. And finally, we had um, the tracking data um, from 2019. So the under racing comes or uses the first two data sources and led us to a data frame with about 3,700 rows um, and six columns that uh, captured about 931 horses. So to create our uh, expected race count model, we used a negative binomial model. 
uh, where we put in the horse, the horse's age, and then also the calendar year, and factored that um, given the COVID-19 pandemic. And we figured out that 27% of horses under race between 2019 and 2021. And interestingly, about 30% of these horses who under raced did so more than once. But one thing that was interesting is even though we posited that um, horses who under raced were uh, more likely to become injured, only one horse who, under, uh, who became severely injured under raced in 2019. Um, or under raced, and even then it was only in 2021. So it wasn't even in the year that they got injured during. So this led us to wonder where those standardized residuals were for the fatally um, or severely injured horses. And what we found was that severely injured horses who were severely injured in 2019 were more like, were likely to race more than expected in 2019 and less than expected in the years to follow, so in 2020 and 2021. And this leads us to what we want to do in the future, which is maybe have a more expansive view on um, our residual analysis and thinking more about how overracing might actually be correlated um, to injuries, especially severe or fatal ones in horses. All right, and now I'm going to give you guys a look into our third data set, uh, which is the 2019 NYRA tracking data, which is, by the way, publicly available as part of the uh, Big Data Derby from this past year. All right, so this data is big. Um, it's about 5 million observations um, with 41 different columns, different you know variables. And this is all tracking data. So it's XY data um, taken frame by frame every quarter second for every horse in a, who raced in a qualifying race uh, in 2019. And this is a look at what the data, data looks like. If you plot one of these races, um, you'll see right the horses will start here and they'll loop around all the way to the finish line. That's a look at one of the races. We have, what is it, 300 or so races uh, in the total data set. Um, from there, we took the XY coordinates and using some uh, formulas provided uh, by the Zealous Analytics team, which we'd like to, we'd like to thank them for that, very, very useful, uh, we were able to compute uh, quite a few interesting um, additional metrics in addition to just XY. Uh, the simplest of which are speed and acceleration versus time. Here you have the speed and acceleration versus time curves for horses across nine races. Um, they're the same nine races on the left and on the right. Uh, you'll notice that basically every race starts with a massive acceleration out of the gate, followed by a deceleration. But sometimes you have races where it sort of slows down, increases again. You guys will notice some patterns here. Um, so these are just two of the metrics that we were using in, uh, from the uh, tracking data. Two more are lateral movement and cumulative lateral movement. So obviously these two are connected. Lateral movement describes moving side to side, right? So horses are running on a curved track, but as they run down a curved track, they're also wavering side to side, right? There's movement side to side. We thought that maybe horses that move side to side more, they might get injured more, right? Because that's a less natural movement pattern for horses. You think about where their legs are, how they're trying to run, more side to side movement could be either indication that they are injured or potential uh, cause for a future injury. So lateral movement is just their lateral movement at you know at a moment in time. Cumulative lateral movement adds that up over the course of a race. So it's it's strictly increasing. And then uh, we used a new metric, uh, which is uh, pioneered by our own Kuang Win, uh, who helped us advise uh, helped advise us on this project. Um, strain. Uh, this is derived from material science. Uh, very 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 cool. A uh, very cool metric with some interesting properties. Basically, measures the deformation of a material over time. Um, say any two points in a material, if they're getting closer or further away, the strain weight, right, would indicate whether it would sort of indicate the deformation, right? So if they're getting further apart, strain rate would say would increase, right? Think about like stretching a rubber band. If they get closer together, it'd do the opposite. So strain would decrease. Now. The strain that we implement is the one implemented in uh, Kuang's paper, uh, which is just taking the negative of this um, to make it so that horses that approach each other, uh, each other, so that horses that are closer together, or horses that are running towards each other, if you think about it like they're moving closer together on the track, their strain would increase. Um, so we have the formula for that written up here. It's negative velocity over distance. So again, as horses, as their approach velocities increase, so basically they're, they're moving towards each other, strain would increase. As their distance decreases, strain would increase. So basically, we wanted to use this metric because it would sort of give us an idea of how horses are being affected by other horses in the race. 
race. They're not running this race in isolation, not running one at a time. They're all running together. So we thought, hey, if horses are running really clumped up, they're going to have high strain rates, and that might indicate some injury. And so um, we have uh, we basically treated the horses like particles in uh, the material science application. And so this is a look at average strain at each moment of time for each horse in a race. You guys will notice there's wide spikes right at the front, right, when they get out of the gates and they all sort of move towards the inner rail. Big spikes in strain because they're all moving into the clump. Then as they stay around zero, that's indication that they're sort of remaining in like a, a similar state. And then it sort of spikes up at the end um, as they approach the finish. All right, so what have we done so far? Uh, we've looked at the distribution of injured and under racing horses. We've also computed summary statistics um, on those curves. So for each one of those curves, we computed summary statistics like the mean of the curve, the standard deviation of the curve, trying to parametrize these movements and try to get like a picture of the patterns of um, how horses race. What comes next? Some principal component analysis uh, to identify the important summary statistics, and then some model-based clustering um, to sort of and, and to determine are any of these particular movement profiles more projecting uh, or predictive of injury. So that's where I'll hand it over to Chris Wilson. So first, we ran the principal component analysis, like Jonathan said. Um, and then this right here is the pie plot of the PCA, the resulting. The first thing to note is that we computed numerous sum statistics for speed, for acceleration, for strain rate. These are the first 10 principal components that combine to explain 92% of the variation in the data. You'll see that the first principal component explains 31.8%, and the second one explains 16%. One thing that we found interesting was that all of these arrows right here have similar direction and magnitude, indicating that those variables are correlated with one another. And right away, you might be thinking that's a little bit of a problem, but due to the nature of principal component analysis, each principal component is independent of each other. And so when we um, cluster on these combinations of principal components, that correlation is taken care of. We don't have to worry about it. And that is what we did. The profile on your right is clustered by lateral movements, and then one of them is combinations of horse movements. So we had some, um, some of the data for lateral movement we weren't able to have access to to compute those lateral movements, so that's why we separated them in this case. Um, the movement profiles are those combinations of those variables, those summary statistics, those speed and acceleration combinations, those acceleration and strain combinations, things like that. What we're looking at here is the proportion of horses that underraced by the analysis of the clustering results. We can see that relatively they're pretty low for underracing. Um, that ninth cluster might actually have zero, which is interesting. There wasn't much signal we picked up here. But like Sarah alluded to earlier, horses that underraced and how they underraced, how they were injured or not in future years was um, a bit related. So we can see here that these proportions are pretty low. When we look at whether horses were injured, it's almost like the inverse of that. So just for the comparison's sake, we see that with movement profiles, there's at least some horses getting injured. We move on to injury, there's a lot of, it just decreases, and some are even zero, except for this ninth cluster that had almost zero horses under race. We now see a quarter of them got injured in this data set. And so future work, obviously, would be to investigate this, to have more data, and see if there is any more association that we could find here. And that is one thing we did. We can see through this table that the ninth cluster, um, the thing we want to point out here is that their um, range of summary statistics, specifically the, the minimum minus the maximum gives us um, the range, it's wider than that of the other clusters. So we propose that maybe variations in these summary statistics, higher spikes in speed, higher spikes in acceleration, higher strain rates, more variance in these across many races might be associated with injury. And a one number summary statistic of this is CV, coefficient of variance. Variation, the ninth cluster that had a quarter of them injured is significantly higher than these other clusters. Just to summarize sort of our main findings and future work, we see that um, many horses race less than expected, and the ninth cluster was um, particularly um, indicative potentially of injury and under racing. Future work will be to collect more start information, more data to hopefully get more um, significant results here. Computing lateral movement, like we alluded to, for every distance, and then potentially a multi-level modeling, accounting for individual horses, because we know horses aren't um, the same. Like, some horses are going to be better than others. We, there's a distribution of horses that we want to look at. All right. Um, we'd like to thank our advisors, uh, Dr. Ron Yerho and Kwong Win, for their help in this project. Um, same with CMU uh, faculty and staff. They were extremely supportive during our time here. Also, big thanks to Brendan Kumagai and uh, his Big Data Derby uh, submission, which helped us a lot. Uh, 
thanks to Zealous Analytics. And thank you so much to Dr. Meg Ellenwood and Dr. Uh, Shamindra, uh, who is currently, yeah. <laughs> okay, oh, Mr. Shamindra, he'll, he'll get there, he'll get there. He's a doctor. He's a doctor. Oh, future, sorry. <laughs> Few, uh, potential future doctor, Meg Ellingwood, and Dr. Shaminta Shortia, who's uh, cur currently killing it at, uh, as the head data scientist at Walmart. So big thanks to them. If you want to read our paper, our report, you're more than welcome to do so here. And thank you so much for your time. All right, thanks, guys. Uh, one question. First of all, I prefer the term proto-doctor. <laughs> That's what I would always use. Um, for the strain rate, uh, either to clarify or if this was, wasn't discussed, uh, was that just between individual horses and how did you then deal with it as cumulative? Because obviously everybody's moving and I can see it not necessarily being a straight linear effect, for instance. Yeah, so um, the strain rate or the strain was calculated between each pair of horses in a race at each moment of time. So that's a, it's a metric calculated frame to frame. And so we have that for each horse and every other horse. Then we could just calculate the average by averaging the strain that a horse was under um, compared to the other horses in the race. And so for those other horses, um, like where you see big differences, because obviously they're all, mo you'd think they're all moving together, they're all moving towards the finish line. They might have similar, you know, strain metrics. You actually, we actually saw that wasn't the case. There were some horses that had unique spikes and unique dips, which indicate coming closer to or being in the center of the pack versus on the outside or falling away um, from, like, from the pack or pulling away from the pack. So when you see those outlier strains, that's indicative of like, things that we were interested in. That's why we calculated the max and min and, and other uh, relevant uh, summary statistics to try to try to capture that. Did that answer your question? Well, have you considered that it might not be linearly additive is my question. Yes. Yeah. So I, I don't believe it's a linearly additive metric at all. It's more, it's actually very, it's very, I would say it's, it'd be very interesting to to investigate the relationship between strain and like finishing position or like position like relative to all the other horses because it wouldn't like I, I totally that totally makes total sense yeah it probably wouldn't be linearly uh, related all right thank you